Mike, I think that remains to be seen because we have this Walmart mass smart deal still hanging in the balance at this stage. Could we see South Africa as a gateway to Africa, given what is playing out at the moment? Yeah, I think that the noise around MassMart mass uh, and Walmart's transaction is, is noise. Uh, there's a lot uh, in play. There's a lot of leveraging and, 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 and manipulation probably going on behind the scenes, and it's tough. But I think that Africa certainly needs a launch pad. It doesn't have to be South Africa. It could be, I guess, Egypt if it normalizes. It could be Nigeria. There's lots of competition. But South Africa is a fantastic uh, uh, series of advantages. One, political, cultural, Secondly, infrastructure, technical, legal, accounting services, banking is right up there. The market's so sophisticated. So certainly it, it, it is a natural uh, player in that space. So I think we should probably discount a little bit of the noise around MassBart, Walmart, uh, and, and look to the future. There are also some examples of, of banks, um, industrials, and so forth that already have a footprint north and are doing well. Well, if we are seeing South Africa as a launch pad into Africa, how does the investor take advantage of that? You mentioned banks, and I'm sure people who are invested in Standard Bank will already have seen some of the benefits of that African expansion. Yeah, I think that you know, if you look at if you look at investment, there's a classical established blue chip type of an approach, or there's uh, blue sky, new stuff, exciting stuff, not without risk. Standard Bank's uh, probably the most established of the banking groups in in the African uh, uh, example. Uh, and no doubt they've been through some terribly tough times in, in establishing that, that foothold, which gives them a, a degree of barrier to entry, a resistance you know, to a second adopter or a late adopter. Um, the other thing, the other portal, so you could go directly through companies like ShopRite, like Standard Bank. Uh, also you mentioned some of the mining cell phone guys. operators like MTN. MTN, massive uh, benefit out of their Nigerian footprint, where South Africa has has probably, in the Nigerian example, and many to come, has leapfrogged the fixed line technology into, into cellular, uh, which puts a person in a small village who used to make goodies and have to sell them to the nearest merchant in a, at a distinct advantage because he can go to the market. He can communicate with the market without fixed line uh, massive capital uh, costs and, and, and investment costs like that. But just the portal to these funds is that they are new, but South Africa has, I think, uh, you have a Standard Bank uh, Africa ETF that's been launched. You have a, uh, another fund, um, uh, Sunlum, created a unit trust. So there are ways and means. They're small, they're new, uh, reasonably untested. But uh, you can either go direct through the equity or through one of these ETFs or unit trusts. Uh, how do you see the risk reward of those uh, funds? I think that the, uh, the African story is that Africa's growth rate uh, is, is estimated to be 5% or a little more this year. That's better than at home. Um, that is not without risk, but I guess when one invests through a stockbroker or an advisor or a fund manager, what you're doing is you're acknowledging that you don't have that expertise and they might. Uh, the proof will be in the pudding there. They are good guys, they're well-traveled, very experienced. The mining chaps out of South Africa have a continent rich in minerals and, and, and stuff that comes out the ground better qualified than perhaps the Indian or Chinese guys that are going in and buying those resources as competitors. So we, if we get our act together, there are opportunities and they will be rich pickings, but they're not for the faint hearted. They're not for a moms and pops type investor who just wants to get rich. It's far too dangerous for that. It's not a given outcome. Let's just focus slightly and talk about inflation and interest rates and get your views on that because we, has, we had that inflation number out last week, 4.2% for CPI. So looking fairly benign at this stage, but we've had the Reserve Bank telling us inflation will reach the top of that target by the end of this year, perhaps going to 6.3% in the first quarter of next year. Uh, where would you be investing at the moment just given the inflation outlook? Well, inflation-linked bonds are probably one of the safe bets. Uh, properties with rental streams that escalate are another safe bet. Uh, equities are you in play. The companies, uh, South African companies, have got outstanding management. That's a broad statement, but the top companies have. Um, they've taken the pain in the last couple of years. The market will reward over time. Uh, so you can invest into something that has a growth profile on it, as long as the earnings profile is sufficient to meet your needs in the medium term. So the dividends or the returns that you get out of your assets must be what you rely on, not an absolute predictable growth, because those two are not good bedfellows. Of course, we know the property sector generally seems to follow the, the, the bond market, doesn't it? It does, it does, uh, Stephen. I think that there is the, the, a property is, is a, is a long-term illiquid bond. You should get a premium for that 
degree of illiquidity over sovereign or, or investment grade bonds, um, but they do track. They, they have an inverse relationship to interest rates. So when interest rates go up, you should just watch. Uh, it does not mean that one should disinvest from prime quality listed or private properties, but certainly the market moves into a phase where the capitalized rate of the properties changes and makes the capital value lower. But if you've got a great set of tenants in a great set of locations, you're going to do well anyway. And just uh, on inflation like bonds, what sort of percentage of your portfolio would you put into ILBs? Um, it depends on the cycle that we're in, in an interest rate cycle. Inflation linked bonds are a natural hedge with great credit behind them uh, to the vagaries of a, of a market. And with the world sort of staring down the, the, the barrel of massive liquidity creation, inflation should raise its ugly head. Uh, it's not that ugly a head if controlled, uh, but ILBs are a, a, a fairly technical asset again. I probably would recommend the retail investor use professional managers or funds uh, who, can, who can make those asset allocation calls. I probably wouldn't think it's smart to sort of say a 10% or a 20% exposure to ILBs and everyone goes out there and heads headlong into a market that they don't understand is quite, uh, is quite complex. You talk about using a professional manager. Do you look for an active or a passive manager? Is there any evidence to suggest that active managers have done particularly much better than passive managers? That's, that's a fantastic debate and it's probably one that will wage for the next forever in the, in the markets. What has happened there is that the advent of passives uh, came to the market in, in very simple form. So for instance in South Africa, the, probably the best known is the Satrix, uh, which is, a, which is a, a passive investment that tr tracks very accurately the pricing of the top 40 stocks. It weighs them uh, according to their market caps. So the risk with them is that you could be very, very exposed in the South African example to resources or perhaps to the top 10 or 15 stocks. You don't really have a, a footprint across the market. So it's not representative of the whole market. Where that market has evolved globally and now locally is into enhanced uh, um, index products. Uh, so for instance, you could, you could buy a product which has an equally weighted uh, uh, spread across top stocks. You could buy one which, is, which focuses on how well uh, companies uh, perform in the de delivery of dividends and, and the like. And we're very uh, interested in, in those investments because you probably find that uh, a, a strict passive in the old sense of it would cost you maybe a half or three quarters of a percent. An enhanced uh, tracker would maybe cost you one percent, whilst an active fund typically would have a cost of between one and a half and two or a little bit more even than that.